So we are beginning a new series today called Born to Slay. Now, this is the way the world fights. They fight with swords. They fight with the weapons of the world, right? But, but this is not the way that we fight. And we are so tempted to fight the way the world fights. Aren't we? Aren't we tempted to fight that way? Whenever we come up against an obstacle, whenever we come up against something that makes us afraid, or we come up against something in our lives that we've never experienced before, our tendency is to, to be afraid or try to take some action ourselves instead of letting that battle become God's battle. But here's what I want you to know about this series and about this message today, which is more of an introduction message to the series. The thing that I want you to know is that whenever you come up against something that stands in your way, whenever you uh, have a diagnosis, whenever you have a problem, a relationship problem, whenever you have a problem with something that's internal in your life, maybe like a particular sin or something of that nature, whenever you come up against something like that, I want you to know this one thing, and it's the title of our message today, that I was born for this. Can you say that with me? I was born for this. Let's say it again. I was born for this. It's true. I was born for this. Because this is the ground. This is the battleground here. This is what God wants to take. He wants you to be victorious here in your own heart, in your own life. That's what he wants. And you were born for this purpose. You were. You weren't born to just struggle through life aimlessly. You were born for this. You were born for this battle. You were born for this fight. We're going to talk about the story of David and Goliath today. I really got this, this idea for this series and this message, message today. I really got it from a book by Malcolm Gladwell called David and Goliath. It's not a Christian book, but I would recommend it. And the idea is that whenever we see the story of David and Goliath, we, we look at it in this way, that Goliath was this terrible, fierce champion adversary, and David was the underdog, and David need a, needed a miracle from God in order to be victorious over Goliath. That's the way we think of it, right? Nothing could be further from the truth, as you'll see later in this message. I want to pick up the story. I could tell you the whole thing, but it would take far too long. Um, but let me just say this, that, that David had been discovered by Saul as someone who could play the harp or the lyre, the stringed instrument. And, and he had been discovered by uh, Saul and David at this time when he goes to fight Goliath, he is going back and forth between his father Jesse's house, who was an old Jesse was an old man at this time, and he was going back and forth between his home, taking care of family business, and and then going to visit Saul to comfort him with music because God because Saul had had disobeyed God. And God had taken his spirit from Saul and he had given him an evil spirit to uh, torment Saul. Because Saul, had, he had uh, disobeyed God. He had done things that God was, uh, was not happy with. And he turned out not to be the leader that God wanted him to be. And so... Whenever David came to bring supplies to his brothers, he sees this giant, Goliath. And he's out on the, the middle of the battlefield. It's in a valley between two hills. And he's out there. And the scripture says that he's a champion. And he is intimidating the army of God. 
And David thought that this was just unconscionable. I mean, he just couldn't imagine the nerve of someone, a Philistine, coming out and taunting the army of God. Because, see, David had been in the fields. He had been in the wilderness tending sheep. And he knew what it was to depend on God. He knew God. God spoke to him. God gave him songs. God, God was with him in the wilderness. And whenever uh, a bear or a lion or some predator came to, to do something to the sheep, to kill a sheep or to take a sheep, um, David had experience. This is something that nobody realized, that this young teenage boy had experience and he knew that he could go after that predator and he could defeat that predator, kill the predator, and take the sheep back. That was his job. He had experience. He had faith in God. He had confidence in God. And that's who David was. And when he saw Goliath on the battlefield taunting, daring to taunt the the armies of God, he couldn't believe it. And so this is where we find David when he goes to Saul and he says to Saul that he wants to fight Goliath. And this is how it went. He said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are, not able to go, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. What was he telling David? He was telling David, you are not qualified. And that, I hate to say it, but somebody is going to tell you that. When you come up against an obstacle, when you come up against a diagnosis, when you come up against something in your life that rattles you to the core, and whenever God calls you to do something that you have never done before, I promise you this, somebody is going to say you're not qualified. I have a lot of experience with this because whenever I could tell you Lots of experiences that I've had with this. But I'll just tell you, uh, the biggest and most recent one was when we started this church. I began to tell people who were close to me, uh, close friends and family members and mentors, and you'd be amazed. You would be amazed at who would tell you, don't do it. Don't do it. These are some of the things that I heard. It's, I wouldn't advise it. I wouldn't advise that. It's too hard. It's too difficult. What what you're trying to do is too difficult. Um, Listen, people were telling me this because they were concerned about me. They didn't want me to make make a mistake. And, And so people told me I wouldn't do it. People will not come. People will not come. It's too hard. You don't have any people. You don't have any money. You don't have any staff. You don't have anything. You know, you're talking about doing something with nothing, you know. Uh, There were three people who encouraged me. Lene encouraged me. And the Holy Spirit was my greatest encourager. When I would pray, all I would get is, yes, go, go, yes. That's what I would get when I would pray. And then the third person who encouraged me, was a guy that uh, was, a, was a, um, a professor of mine in college, but he was also a friend, and he was actually the chaplain at uh, Huntington College when I was there in Montgomery. And, and he said to me, he said this to me. He quoted David. He said this to me. He said, the same God that was with you when you went to the jail... When you went to the jail and did jail ministry, and all those men, week after week after week, came 
to and knelt on that concrete floor and gave their lives to Jesus. The same God that was with you there, then and there will be with you when you start the net. It's true. And that has been true. That has been true. And so uh, someone is going to tell you that you're not qualified. In fact, you're going to think that yourself. Every time, God, every time God calls you to do something that you've never done before, you have no experience, you have no confidence in, being in, the, in your own ability, whenever that happens, you, your, own, your own mind, your own heart will say, you're not qualified, you're not qualified. In fact, when I went to my friend, Dr. Jimmy Jeffcoat, who encouraged me, what I said to him is, I'm not qualified. That's what I said to him. And he said, the same God that's been with you and the jail will be with you when you start the church. He said, you're qualified. Another friend of mine went to start a church uh, months ago, and, and he said to me, he said, I'm not qualified. I wonder if every pastor thinks that when they go to start a church, but but he said to me, very genuine, loving guy, he said, I'm not qualified. And I said, I know you, brother. I know you. I said, I know who lives in you. I know you. I've seen him at work in your life. You're qualified. Because if God is for you, who can be against you? So, so you're going you're gonna to run up against this in life. Whenever God speaks to you, to do something, or whenever you run up against an obstacle, the first thing the enemy is going to say is, you're not qualified. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep when the lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock. I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. He had confidence. And he had experience. I'm going to tell you something. You and I need to gain some confidence and experience in this area. We do. When something happens, we need to have confidence. When something happens that we're not expecting, we need to have confidence in God and know that no matter who we are, we know who he is. And when that enemy comes after us, he is no match for us. He said, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. And here it is. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. See, David saw things differently than other people. All the people around him, they saw Goliath as a, 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 a force that was insurmountable. Right? He's... He's nearly 10 feet tall. He's 9 feet 9 inches tall, according to what the Scripture says. Big man, right? Big man. Calls, the Scripture says that he's a champion. He was a champion. A big guy, a fierce guy. And that's the way it looked to everybody else. But David knew that God was with him, and he knew that no one was any match for God. And this whole principle that we think the enemy has the advantage, no way. We have the advantage. David looked at Goliath and he saw that he had the advantage. Everybody else looked at Goliath and they thought that Goliath had the advantage. But David looked at Goliath and he thought, I have the advantage. In fact, David knew that he had the advantage. Some people think that, that David only defeated Goliath because 
He had some miracle that happened with God, and God provided the miracle and the victory. And that's the only way that David could have possibly slung a stone and hit the forehead of Goliath and killed him. But David had confidence. He had ability, and he knew that he had the advantage. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on the sword over his tunic and tried walking around. He just tried walking. He just tried walking because he was not used to them. And then he said, I, I, can't, I can't fight in this. This is not me. This is not me. I can't fight the way you fight. And I can't fight the way Goliath wants me to fight. See, the enemy wants you to fight the way he fights. Whenever someone says something derogatory to you, he, the enemy wants you to say something derogatory back to the person, right? When someone offends you, the enemy wants you to offend that person. Fight like me. Fight like me. But God does not fight like we fight. When Peter w took his sword out and cut off the, the servant's ear, you remember that in the, in the garden? He cut off the man's ear. And, and Jesus said to Peter, he said, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. He, we're going to get more into this in the rest of the series, but our weapons are not the same kinds of weapons as the world. We don't fight the same way. The fact is we don't fight fair because this is really unfair because we have the advantage. We do. We have the advantage. When someone, when someone accuses you, when someone uh, berates you, when someone... Um, when someone downs you in some way, maybe by their actions or maybe they, they uh, disregard you, that's the one that really gets me. When somebody disregards me, it really gets my pride. My pride can't handle being disregarded. And so whenever that happens, there's a, there's a weapon that is so amazing, it's so powerful against that. And you know what it is? Forgiveness. It'll take you from hatred to love. Almost like that. And when you go from hatred to love, and when you use that weapon of forgiveness, God rewards you almost immediately. And I have experienced this so many times that when someone offends me in such a terrible way that I have every right. Anyone would say, you have every right to be angry. You have every right to defend yourself. You have every right. I find that if I will forgive, I find that God's favor appears right here almost immediately. When I have a chance to retaliate and I don't, I feel God's favor right here. This is the battleground. See, this is, other people think it's your reputation that you're trying to save, that you're trying to gain your reputation, or you're trying to gain money, or you're trying to gain power, or you're trying to gain something in this world. But really, it's our own souls that we're trying to gain. It's our own souls that God wants us to take hold of. He wants us to, to, to be victorious here, this is where he wants us to be victorious. And he will help us. So rule number two is don't fight like the enemy does. That's what the enemy wants you to do. They wanted David to fight like the enemy. And David had a different plan. So meanwhile... The Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, 
kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. I think he despised him because he was insulted. They, they sent a boy out to fight a giant. I think he was insulted. And I also think that when he saw the sling, he was a little bit afraid. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here. He said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. He's prophesying to David. Come here. First, come here. Come come here. Come here. I can't deal with you over there. Come here. That's what the enemy wants us to do. Come here where I am. Fight like me. Come close to me. Come on. I need to get within reach so I can smack you with my sword. He says, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He said, come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. But David, he said, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. I come to you not in my name. I come, in, I come to you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. This day he begins to, to prophesy to his enemy. He says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army. See, See, Goliath was just going to give David's carcass to the birds and the animals. But David comes along and he says, This very day I will give the carcasses not only of you, but of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. What do you, what do you think God is thinking? What do you think God is feeling right there? He's feeling, I have found a man who believes in in me, who believes in my power. I, I f finally, in all of Israel, there appears someone who will stand up to the enemy in my name. It's the same thing that he feels about you when you do the same thing. So, David began to prophesy to the giant and that's the third thing. Prophesy to the giant. Amen. Prophesy to your giant. What is your giant? Just start talking. Start talking to him. Who is your giant? What is your giant? What is it? I make a regular practice of talking to my giants. And I prophesy to them. I tell them, you will not be victorious against me because greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. He is greater in me. Is anybody excited about this? Amen. I'm telling you. Prophesy to your giant. And it's okay to talk big when you're talking about God. When you talk big about yourself, it doesn't get you very far. In fact, uh, when I hear somebody, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Maybe I, was, maybe I said this last week, I can't remember, but I've been watching a lot of MMA fights on uh, YouTube. And because you know that I like violence. I mean, I've told you, I've confessed that before, right? But I, uh, I've been watching these fighters, and it happens like this. So the challenger comes into the ring. You get, you've got a young, new challenger, somebody who's really good, very talented, and they come into the ring, and they're so humble that first time when they want to, to try to defeat the champion. Oh, I'm just, I'm just blessed to be here. I'm just so grateful to have the opportunity. And then they win. Am I right, Hampton? They win, 
And then the next time, I'm so just thankful to be here, you know, because they're not sure. They won last time. Maybe that was a fluke. They don't know. And then they beat the next person, the next challenger. And then the, the third time, yeah, I'm very confident. We've been in the gym. We've been working. I'm really confident about this fight. I, I think I'm going to be victorious in this fight. And then they win again. And pretty soon, they say, ain't nobody out there can beat me. I am the best there is. Ronda Rousey said, I'm going to, I'm, she said this right before she got defeated. You remember this? She said, she said, I'm going to retire undefeated. Boom. <laughs> right before she got the knock, the knockout, the knockdown. Actually, it was a foot, wasn't it? She got a foot to the face and she is out on the canvas. You know Why? Because there is a universal rule for all of us, and it is this, that pride goes before the fall. When you see somebody saying, nobody's going to whoop me, you're seeing somebody that's just about, just right there, about to get shown the canvas. It happens in fighting, boxing, MMA, happens all the time. So, let's get back to our story. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. Let me tell you something about slingers. In our military today, we have Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, right? In their military, they had... They had the frontline soldiers. They had people like Goliath who carried a, a shield and a sword. And they had archers who were really good with a bow and arrow. And then they had slingers. I've done some reading about slingers. Slingers can, they would take a small, smooth stone and they would put it in their sling. And they would would get the velocity that they needed and let that rock go. And they, had, they were such marksmen, and they, and they shot their, their sling with such precision that historians say that they could shoot a bird out of the sky in mid-flight. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. In fact... One historian said, and I got this from uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book. One historian said that for David to enter the battlefield with a sling against Goliath was like a marksman walking onto the battlefield with a 45 caliber pistol. In fact, let's just go a little bit further. In that day, the slingers were so effective that they have found medical instruments, just like our medical instruments, that they could go inside the, the brain or the, 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 uh, the chest or the abdomen where the stones had gone in. They could go in and they had a, a tool for extracting those rocks. It was a bullet. We think that David had the disadvantage, but all along David knew that he had the advantage. We think that we're at a disadvantage because we're Christians and we have to play nice. Mm -mm. We think we're at a disadvantage because we have to turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, forgive. We can't, we can't raise up our hand against the enemy like, like everybody else does, so we think we're at a disadvantage, right? Not true. Not true. We have the advantage. Listen. The stone sank into his forehead. Just like David meant for it to. Just like David knew that it would. He took five stones. How many stones did it take? One. He took five stones. Listen. <laughs> He didn't take 20 stones. 
He didn't take 15 stones. He took five. This is David's thinking. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sure I'll hit him with the first one. But if I don't hit him with the first one, it might take two or three. Or on my very worst day, it might take five. So I'll have to run here and I'll have to run there and I'll have to sling here and sling. And you know that a slinger could put the rock in the sling and let it go within one second. That's how fast it was. David had the advantage. He knew that he had the advantage. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. A stone. A sling and a stone. One. Without a sword in his hand. And he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran over and ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from his sheath. After he had killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. And when the Philistines saw that their hero, Goliath, was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines. And you know what happened next. They killed him. And fed their bodies to the birds and the wild animals. Right? See, David had the advantage all along. David had the advantage and he knew he had the the advantage. What's the difference between David and us? He knew he had the advantage. And we, most of the time, don't realize that we have the advantage. That's what this series is about. We have the advantage. How is it that we think that we don't have the advantage? I've been trying to to figure that one out. How is it that we think we're at a disadvantage because we have God? How is that? I'll tell you some of the things. These are just a few of the things, but these are some of the things that we do have. We have prayer. And some of you are thinking, ah, prayer. Prayer. Uh, you know, I pray and nothing happens. I pray. I'm not sure how all that works, prayer. Let me tell you something. Prayer is a very powerful thing. Amen. It's very powerful. Prayer is very powerful in when it's used by someone who believes. Amen. It's true. See, I had some people have been praying over here, I can tell. It's a very powerful thing. I don't know how many times my, my physical life has been saved by prayer. I remember we, we, when I was in high school, we were in a passenger airplane that almost went down. And as we were riding, this felt like a roller coaster ride. It was just boom, boom. Boom, and we were riding it down, and I had my hands, 737, 27, and I, was, I had my hand on the outside armrest, and my, my mother was here, and my brother was here, and it was, it was a bumpy ride, and, and we, were, we, were, we were nose down and kind of turned to the left, and I was looking out the window, and I was seeing the, the water coming up, and, and I said to God, I said, I'll be there in just a minute. And I was not kidding. I mean, it was not one of those times when I thought there might be a possibility that we would survive. But I said, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'll, be, I'll see you in, in just a minute. I'll see you. And, and by some miracle, right before we hit the water, and this was confirmed by the, the air traffic controllers, we found out later, but they thought we were going down. Another time, I was a hydroplane on I-40 in Nashville, and I was spinning like this. And I, every time I would come around, I would see the the guardrail to the bridge, and I was gonna. I was. It looked like I was gonna go right off the side of this hill uh, and into other traffic that was going this way. 
and, and it looked like I was going to go right off the rail there, and somehow it, it went the other way, and I ended up in the median. And all I was saying the whole time is, Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Sometimes, sometimes it's just one of those prayers. Oh, God. Prayer. How can, how can we be at a disadvantage when we have prayer? And I've actually prayed longer prayers than those two, by the way. And, and sometimes I pray a longer prayer. And I've seen, since we started this church, I've seen so many prayers answered. I got a picture from Steve the other day who has had bladder cancer, right? And, the, and he was holding up a sign that said, cancer free. <laughs> cancer free. I was talking to my friends the other day. I'm not going to say your names. I'm just going to point to you. I was not expected to live. I was told, go and enjoy your last year. Right? Cancer free. Thank God. Cancer free. Woo. Prayer works. You know what the scripture says? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. The, the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. And then we have salvation. Some people follow God because they think that it's just going to save them from hell. I know too many people trying to get fire insurance. You ever heard that? You ever heard that? I, hell does not, I don't even think about hell. Do y'all think about hell? I mean, really, I don't even think about I, hell. I don't, I don't follow Jesus to stay out of hell. I follow Jesus because he is my Lord. He I have every advantage with him. He loves me unconditionally. I, I, I don't follow him because he's going to save me from hell. I follow, I follow him because he's going to save me from a bad decision. He's going to save me from getting hurt. He's going to save me from getting sick. He's going to save me from all of these things that the enemy wants to do to me. He saves me, and I, and I see this salvation on, that happens with me on a daily basis. That's who he is. That's his nature. He saves saves. You need saving? He saves. That's who he is. Redemption. Oh man. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Galatians 3:13. Being made a curse for us for it is written, cursed is every person who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, that's us, and that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. That's redemption. That means he has paid the price for us. I'll take it. Will you take redemption? How about forgiveness? Have you ever had a sin that you committed that drove you nuts? You couldn't stop thinking about it. You ever had one of those? I have. I'm a type A person. And man, I'm type A. I type A myself. I do. And I remember going to when I, you know, I, I told you, I don't know if I told you, I think it was my small group we told, I told last week. I've been married before. When I was, I was married in my early 20s, and after that, I thought I was washed up. I thought it was all over. I was damaged. I was, I was, I was not worth anything that God would be able to use me. But God, He redeemed me. And he forgave me, and I was able to forgive myself, and now I can for forgive others. Man, what a powerful thing forgiveness is. What a powerful thing redemption is. We'll talk more about this redemption when we get over here. But forgiveness is a powerful thing. Someone can can pull out all the stops on you and then call you every name and accuse you of everything. But I'm telling you, forgiveness will wash it all away. And, and they won't be able to get in here anymore. They won't be able to get to you anymore. They won't be able to, 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 to pick that fight with you anymore. You can just smile and you can just go on with your life. Wisdom. James said, if anybody lacks wisdom... Let him ask of God who gives generously or liberally to all who ask. 
Will you take that? Will you take wisdom? Amen. Some of y'all need some wisdom, I'm telling you. <laughs> I know I do. Joy. What is joy? Come on. What is joy? Jesus, I like that, Jesus, others, yourself. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That's where we get our strength from. I'm telling you, I can be down, and I've seen it. I've, I've seen it even at funerals before. I've seen way too many funerals. I've participated in way too many funerals over the years. Probably a hundred or more funerals through the years. And I have seen this time and time again when you know when you're there and you're talking about the person and joy begins to bubble up not joy that they're gone but joy that they were here Amen. isn't that good to know that you got you got the opportunity to know that person that person was a part of your life isn't that an awesome thing, joy. Joy will pop up when you least expect it sometimes. Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But Jesus said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. When I come up against a mountain, I don't ever think, the thought never enters my mind, I'm not getting to the other side of that mountain. I, I never think that. I think, how am I going to get to the other side of the mountain? Am I going around it? Am I going over it? Or am I just going to speak to it and it's going to dissolve out of sight? That's what I, that's, this is not pie in the sky, y'all. This is not uh, spiritual mumbo jumbo. This is real life Christianity, faith. The Holy Spirit. Jesus said, go and wait in the city. And he says, you will receive power when you receive the Holy Spirit. Anybody need a little power in their life? How about the advocate? If we sin, and the scripture says, don't sin. I hear, I hear pastors and t Christian teachers say this all the time. I've heard it my whole life. They say, of course, we're never going to be able to defeat sin in this life. Of course, we're always going to sin. Of course, Where did the of course come from? Where did that come from? Because I can tell you that, the, yes, Jesus didn't believe that. The disciples didn't believe that. The apostles didn't believe that. If you if you, if you don't understand it. Go read the little Johns. Go read what John wrote about sin. But here's what John said. He said, if you do sin, if you do sin, he said, we have an advocate. You know what an advocate is? It's, it's Jesus. He is our attorney. He is our lawyer. He is our representative before the throne of God. And when we sin, Jesus intervenes and he pleads our case. And you know how he pleads it? He doesn't say, oh, give him a break. They're pretty good people, these Christians. They're pretty good people. Just, just give them a break. He doesn't say that. Because that is not how the law works. You know what the wage of sin is? It's death, right? So we got to have something more than that. And so when you... If, if you sin, we have an advocate. And what does the advocate say? He says, Father, I have paid for that sin. That's it. I paid for that sin. I'll take an advocate. Will you take an advocate? How about peace? The chastisement of our peace was upon him. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He paid the price for our peace. How is it that we ever get the idea that we're at a disadvantage? How is it? I mean, seriously. How do we ever think that we have the disadvantage? 
We're just, a, we're just a poor, helpless, weak little Christian bound to be run over by everybody and everything in life. How is it that we ever think that? I'm telling you, if you practice, listen, here's the secret, y'all. If you practice, see, David practiced. What did he practice? A thousand, two thousand, they say ten thousand, ten thousand times does it. Ten, no, ten thousand hours does it. What was David practicing when he was by himself in the wilderness? He was slinging those rocks. He was slinging those rocks thousands of times. He slung his rock at that knot hole on that tree. And finally, boom, he hit it. And he hit it again. And he hit it again. And he hit it again. Until he was confident in his ability. If we will practice these things over and over and over again, we will soon become masters at our craft. We will become warriors that the enemy is afraid of. When Jesus came and the, the demons came up against Jesus, what did they say? Don't hurt me. I want to pray for you and, and for me. I want to pray for us all. This, this is a series that we need, y'all. This is a series that we need. We need it so much. We were born for this fight. And so many of us surrender when we could be victorious. And so I want to pray for us now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the ability to fight in a different way. We thank you for weapons that are not of this world. We thank you for weapons that bring down strongholds. We thank you for weapons that, that bring down the, the enemy in every situation, in every circumstance. And even at the end of our existence in this world, we have eternity waiting on us. When the body gives out, the spirit lives on. And we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us power, the power of the Holy Spirit. And over these next few moments, as we worship you with our tithes and our offerings, I pray that you would bless us, as the scripture says, that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on us that we cannot contain. That means it runs over and blesses other people. I pray that as we give to you, Lord, that you would bless us and that you would teach us how to use the weapons of our faith against the enemy to conquer our own souls, Lord. That is our prayer. We love you. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name.